about an hour and a half. <laughs> Almost about two nine, It's about 90 minutes. We That's had Klaus Kinski last week, so we went on and on and on. Klaus Kinski? Klaus Kinski. Yeah, he was, he was here, and... Uh, <laughs> he covered his films last week. He's dead. Yeah, I know, but we just covered no, his we, films. No, but not me. I probably bought him at an auction, and he's here next to me. <laughs> We showed a bunch so, of his trailers and posters and, you know. He was an interesting guy. Hello, everybody. Welcome once again to the Spaghetti Westerns podcast, the only podcast dedicated to Spaghetti Westerns and the people who made them. Uh, we have a very special guest uh, today, but before we introduce him, let's say hi to our co-host, Tom Betts. Hi, Tom. Hi, Jay. How are you? How are you? You want to mention... Uh, Back Anything about your week? <laughs> Back from the dead, five days in the hospital for cardiac arrest. Not cardiac arrest, but congestive heart failure. But, but you, uh, even they, while they were about to cut you open, you said, wait a minute, i got a podcast to do. I said, I've got Christopher Frailing on, Sir Christopher Frailing on Friday. I'm getting out of here. Oh, okay. So they gave me a life pack, a life vest, and sent me home and said, we'll operate you in the Sometime in the next two months. We have a, we're honored to have a great guest today who really needs uh, no introduction, but he's going to get one anyway. Uh, he's a British educationalist and writer, uh, known for his um, studies in uh, pop culture, including spaghetti westerns. And uh, he has a PhD from uh, Churchill College, uh, Cambridge. He was awarded an honorary Doctor of Arts degree from the University of Bath and was appointed professor of cultural history um, at London's Royal College of Art. Uh, he was also a governor of the BFI in, uh, in the 1980s. He was then knighted in 2001 for services to art and design education. He has a wide output as a writer and critic on subjects ranging from vampires to westerns and as i mentioned earlier his he has specifically studied spaghetti westerns and the life and films of sergio leone he's written four books which i'll name right now spaghetti westerns cowboys and europeans from carl may to sergio leone in 81 sergio leone something to do with death in 2000 sergio leone once upon a time in italy in 2005 and the great, great book, Once Upon a Time in the West, shooting a masterpiece not too long ago uh, from 2019. He's also done audio commentaries for Duck You Sucker, A Fistful of Dollars for A Few Dollars More, and The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. So it's my honor and privilege to welcome to the Spaghetti Westerns podcast, Sir Christopher Failing. He says I can call him Christopher. You know, thanks for inviting me. It feels like I'm coming home. Uh, uh, I can talk spaghetti till the cows come home. <laughs> well, so can Tom and I. So this should be a fun uh, interview. Uh, we're honored that you took the time out to talk to us. We have so many questions regarding the genre we'd like to ask you. And uh, I guess what we'll say is we'll aim for the heart, Ramon. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> indeed. That's what you've got to do. Otherwise, you'll never get me. Right. Well, let's let's talk right off the bat. First things first. You were recently honored at the Almeria Western Film Festival. How did that go? Oh, it was great. Uh, I couldn't get over there because of COVID, but um, in fact, uh, here's the award. Wow! Hey. The Almeria Western Film Festival. It's a Western guy with uh, bat wing doors coming into a bar in Almeria, and it says. Uh, a prize, Desierto de Tabernas, Sir Christopher Frayling, October 2021. And I was thrilled. It was, um, uh, it was a great event. Uh, you know, all sorts of dignitaries there and people representing the neighborhood. And uh, I, I gave a talk for about 20 minutes all about the importance of Almeria in, in the Italian Westerns uh, and the landscape, which is something that people don't often talk about. You know, the great Ramblas, the great canyons, uh, the great deserts and how you've really got everything in Almeria and and what a shame it was that uh, in the 1960s uh, there was no infrastructure for making film there so that you had to send the rushes the dailies off to Madrid to get them processed and then they'd come back and then they'd be scratched or something and then you had to do them again 
Um, so it, it was a great location, but there really wasn't, it, it didn't become a major film center, which I think it could have done if, if they'd invested a bit more in the 60s. But uh, anyway, this all went down very well. And um, uh, I, I heard the, the, the greatest hits of Morricone happening in the background. And uh, they had some screenings of films in the open air on the locations where they took place in Almeria. Mm -hmm. So I'm sorry I wasn't there at the party, but um, they say they're going to invite me next year. So with luck, with COVID all over, uh, I'll be able to go over uh, next year and, uh, and enjoy myself there. It was a great event. I was very touched, actually. And, uh, um, and it, it, yeah, it was, it was a good day. Um, my first official question to you on the podcast takes us back to the beginning of uh, your love for Spaghetti Westerns. I think it was 1967 and you went to the cinema and uh, you saw A Fistful of Dollars. And uh, how did that particular event change your life that set the stage for the next 55 years or so of Spaghetti Western research and writing about the genre? Well, um, it, was, it was very strange. It was... Um, uh, in, in Cambridge, I was still at college in Cambridge, and they have a thing called the May Ball, which is an all-night dance that actually takes place in June. Don't ask. Anyway, it's the May <laughs> Ball that takes place in June. And so we're at the beginning of June of that year, and I'd had it, I'd danced the night away, and it was five in the morning, and I'd had a terrible row with my girlfriend. Uh, I think we realized during the course of the evening that we weren't really suited to each other. And... Uh, so I was feeling fairly glum and I was trudging the streets of Cambridge and at lunchtime I drifted into the cinema that was showing Fistful of Dollars. And I'd read one or two reviews which in, in Britain were pretty bad. You know, they, they, they said um, it was an airsatz American Western, that it was brutal and uh, uh, the music was strange and the costumes were strange and the performances were strange. Uh, and the dubbing wasn't very good, etc. But I drifted into the cinema and I absolutely loved the movie. There was something about the style of it, uh, the design, the costumes, the landscape, the music. Uh, you know, instead of having Aaron Copeland and symphonic uh, American folk tunes, here was a Fender Stratocaster guitar, uh, a, a chorus uh, singing incomprehensible lyrics and, and a youthfulness. There was a youthfulness about it. I, I remember that, that the actors were younger than American Westerns. I mean, at that time, the, the heroes of American Westerns, John Wayne, Jimmy Stewart, uh, Gary Cooper was dead already, but, uh, you know, they were getting on and they were still making Westerns. But, you know, you sat there wondering whether they could still get on a horse or not. You know, they were getting, <laughs> they were getting a little bit elderly. And here was this youthful feeling of everyone was in their late 20s and early 30s. Anyway, I sat in the cinema and watched the film through twice because in those days you had continuous performances. And it became a kind of crusade to persuade other people that this movie had more going for it than the critics had said. So I started writing about it, um, trying to do a bit of research. But I discovered that, you know, the reviews in Italy were equally bad. And the reviews in the, in the United States uh, when the film came out weren't very good either. So it was sort of me against the world at that stage. Um, and... Uh, uh, and, and and then, I mean, the next, oh gosh, what was the next big thing? Um, because in the United States, the three films came out one after the other, you know, because there was a little copyright difficulty with Kurosawa, Akira Kurosawa Productions, because A Fistful of Dollars was derived from Yojimbo without permission. The film was delayed before it was released in the United States, but they came one after the other, you know, at the beginning of the year, Fistful of Dollars, in the spring for a few dollars more, and in the autumn, The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. So it created this huge splash. And I happened to go to the United States in 1968 for the first time in my life on a Greyhound bus from uh, New York across to San Francisco and down again. And I saw an all night screening of the three dollars films in San Francisco. And it was an extraordinary experience because uh, the, the air was full of the sweet smell of success. I mean, you know, everyone was smoking dope. And, uh, and, and, and of course, half the audience was dodging the draft. And there was a very alternative feeling. And there's a moment in The Good, the Bad and the Ugly when Clint Eastwood looks at the battle of the American Civil War for the bridge and says, I've never seen so many men wasted so badly. Yep. And the entire cinema erupted, erupted with excitement at that thought. And I thought, these films have just hit the button. They are absolutely right for the moment. 
1967, 68, uh, that, 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 you know, that there is something about them that, that the cynicism, the comedy, the black comedy, uh, the slightly cynical view of war, uh, um, you know, the American Civil War was someone else's war. The, it, it, the, the characters don't feel any empathy with it. And um, so I thought, well, the, the, these films have got a lot going for them, not just in Italy, but in the United States. Then I started noticing that they had an effect on the Hollywood Western. So, uh, you know, a film like Hang 'em High, for example, uh, mm -hmm. where Dominic Frontier tried to do a Morricone, not very well in my opinion, but not awfully well, but he tried to do a Morricone on the soundtrack. Uh, and Clint Eastwood tried to bring it back home, the character, and indeed the Wild Bunch, you know. I mean, we, I mean if you look at the Wild Bunch, which I loved, um, you know, it's bounty hunters, it's the Mexican-American border, it's, uh, you know, uh, uh, um, it's the time of the Mexican Revolution, and a lot of things that the Spaghettis had made fashionable in 1964, 5 and 6, suddenly become possible in a major Hollywood movie. So I loved The Wild Bunch as well. So you could see the influence of it. The, there's even a John Wayne film. I can't remember which one it is. I think it's Big Jake, where the gag from The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, where, uh, you know, the baddie walks into the bathroom and there's Eli Wallach in a bathtub. And the baddie says, I've been looking for you for several months and every time I should use my right hand, I think about you. And Wallach shoots his gun from underneath the, the soap suds and says, right. if you're going to shoot, shoot, talk about it. That gag reoccurs in a John Wayne movie. And I thought, wow, right. you know, if spaghetti westerns are going to turn up in John Wayne movies. They really are having an international mm -hmm. influence. Right. So, and Richard, anyway, Richard I, Boone wears a poncho. Exactly, exactly. Uh, and it became a sort of crusade to persuade everyone that um, I'd already written quite a lot about Hammer films. Uh, so I seem to specialize in finding movies that <laughs> everyone despised and trying to persuade them that there's more going on than meets the eye. This became my specialty. <laughs> right. Well, let me, let me, and, uh, I, I was going to do a follow-up. Wow. Uh, excuse the green screen, everybody. I was going to do a follow-up on that. Um, you wrote the first and definitive biography on Sergio Leone. Okay, now I'm frozen. Uh, something about death, um, where you explore his life and development and an in-depth analysis of his films. You later went on to write more books about Leone, covering different aspects of his films. What is it about Sergio Leone that makes him your main focus of so many books that you've obviously spent the most time and energy researching? Yeah, it's a, it's a very good question. Uh, it's, um, it's partly, it's partly the, 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 the theme of the movies, and in a way it applies to, to most spaghetti westerns, that you know, when you're in Britain, we love American rock music, we love American fashions, trainers, sports, but we don't all necessarily, you know, subscribe to the Republican Party. And so we detach these things as pure style, in a way, and they're separated from history and tradition and all the things that you know, when you're at home in America, you have to associate the Western with. So it's like a free language. And I think Leone grasped that and treated the Western as a kind of uh, almost an abstract language that you can detach from all its traditions and remix and turn into something else. And I found that very interesting because in a way, the whole story of the media in Britain and Europe is its relationship with America. You know, that's the key question mm -hmm. about, uh, you know, um, you, you get uh, spaghetti westerns in Italy, you get tele novelas in uh, Central America, you get Bollywood in India, and all these all these film industries define themselves in relation to Hollywood. Uh, and what you get is old stories told in new ways that suit the local population. So in Bollywood, you get adventure stories retold for the Hindi speaking population. In Italian Westerns, you get the old stories retold in the first instance for Italian audiences, and then they went international. And that struck me as a really interesting phenomenon. And Leone seemed to be the best at doing that. He was, he was the most cine literate person I've ever met. And I've, you know, I spent a day with Quentin Tarantino when, when I was doing the uh, Once Upon a Time in the West book, but Leone was quite extraordinary for his visual memory of movies. You know, you'd say to him, uh, The Magnificent Seven, and he'd say, yes, close up, Yul Brynner, 
medium shot, uh, Steve McQueen and Yul Brynner, long shot of the seven, music, Elmer Bernstein, and he completely described, not the dialogue, because the dialogue, he didn't understand English. It wasn't the right. dialogue, it was the visuals, you know? And um, so his knowledge of film was profound, and he knew exactly what he was doing with these films. I mean, he wasn't as wacky as Sergio Corbici, who took the whole thing into much more surreal directions. And uh, he, he wasn't so profound, actually, as Sergio Solima, who I think, you know, put much more of a message into his movies. But he had this real sense of his knowledge of the American Western and how to ring the changes. And that fascinated me. You know, we were all, we loved Bob Dylan. Uh, we read Catch-22. We had posters of Che Guevara on the wall of our student lodgings. And there was, there was a thing about, we love America, but we're not sure. And he just mm -hmm. captured that moment for me. And, uh, and that moment in San Francisco sort of confirmed it, that uh, he, 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 he captured a moment of the relationship between Europe and America. And wow. uh, I found that really interesting, you know. And, I, 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 and, and, and you know, like all of us, uh, y you invest heavily in, in your mind in things you see when you're in your teens and 20s, and they stay with you forever. And that's what's happened with Leone's films and, and many spaghetti westerns, actually. Right. I mean, I wouldn't claim greatness for all of them, but uh, some of them are great movies. Had you seen any spaghetti westerns before Fistful? No. Um, actually, yes. I'd seen Buffalo Bill, Hero of the Far West. Oh, okay, with Gordon Scott. Mm -hmm. Yes, as, as a B-movie. And I'd seen the Hammer film, um, Savage Guns. Right. And the Savage Guns is a really, it's quite interesting actually. It was, it was written by Jimmy Sangster, who wrote the Frankenstein and Dracula films for, right. for Hammer, made by Carreras, who was of Spanish origin, who owned the company. And it used a lot of the locations that Leone was subsequently to use, mm -hmm. you know, the church from, church from For a Few Dollars More, uh, etc. cetera. And, um, uh, and it was very brutal uh, compared to most traditional Westerns, and it was set on the Mexican-American border. So I had seen that, and, and that maybe, in a way, planted a seed. But it was the first one I knowingly saw, that I knew it was an Italian-Spanish movie, and, and I knew that people didn't like it for that reason. And, and so I, my, you know, my antennae were, were, were registering all that when I saw Fistful of Dollars. And I rushed out and bought the soundtrack album, oh, which okay. I liked to play. I played at full volume in my student uh, rooms and annoyed the hell out of everyone with uh, Morricone. Because oh. actually the track of that album is that it's a little bit repetitive because the first side is the, uh, the, the, you know, the, the clips from the movie and the second side are the same clips but rearranged as a suite. Mm -hmm. And so people got a little bit bored with hearing uh, trumpet dirges coming out of my room you know, for an hour <laughs> after. But I loved it. I loved it. <laughs> I saw Fistful. And when the scene comes in the very beginning, when Clint rides up to the well, I'm going, oh, no, this is a Mexican Western because of the, uh, the, the, the two adobe huts. And then it, when it went on further and further, and he does the little four bullets, I mean, four coffins, not three. I said, this is, this is great. <laughs> this is completely different than any American Western I've ever seen. Yeah. And then, yeah. like you, we, we couldn't find any album here. We had to put up with Hugo Montenegro and a couple of the other, you know, cover versions for quite a while before we got at, to actually hear Enio. And it's interesting because, you know, the sound of that first film, um, yes, it's partly uh, the sort of Degeo, the, the, the Alamo song with uh, the trumpet dirge, the funeral dirge that's played uh, by this stately trumpet. But, but with the Fender Stratocaster guitar, it sounded like, you know, in Britain, we had this band called The Shadows, right. who did a record, a record called Apache, Apache, which came out a couple of years before. And we had uh, uh, Telstar by the Tornadoes. Tornadoes and, the Beach, right. and the Beach Boys were just beginning to make. And so this sound, you know, with the with with uh, uh, Fender Stratocaster, it was kind of hip. Yep. You know, at the time. It, it chimed with what was going on in the in the pop charts and, and that was a surprise as well because mostly westerns were big symphonic scores um you know a school of aaron copeland and his two students uh, elmer bernstein and jerome moros you know bernstein did uh, the magnificent seven and moros did the big country and there's a sound you know big 
orchestral. It's a big country, so let's have a big sound and rearrange American folk tunes for a symphony orchestra. So when you hear a trumpet dirge and down, 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 you think, wow, that is really strange for a Western. And that was part of it, the, the, the strangeness, but it worked. And it was part of this youthfulness, I think, where, where, where uh, you know, they were injecting youth into uh, a genre that was really running out of puff, I think, in the, in the mid-1960s. Um, can you tell us the story? I know we've, all, we've heard all types of stories, but coming from you, I, it could be official, behind Clint Eastwood being chosen for the lead in A Fistful of Dollars when other actors were almost chosen instead of him? Yes, well, um, uh, the budget was very low for A Fistful of Dollars, and um, they, they, they wanted an American actor for the lead. And uh, he was by no means the first choice. Uh, uh, Leone's first choice was James Coburn. Uh, he was also interested in Cliff Robertson, whom he wanted to cast against type. He thought, you know, this guy that had played President Kennedy in PT-109, wouldn't it be fun to make him into a, in, into a sort of good baddie, you know, and, and, and keep the audience on its toes? and uh, 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 an American actor in, in Italy called Richard Harrison. And, and uh, they were all considered. And then one day, the uh, uh, representative of the William Morris Agency in Rome uh, screened an episode of Rawhide. It was actually called Incident of the Black Sheep, which is about the conflicts between the cow people and the sheep people. And there was Clint Eastwood. And Leone always claimed, it sounds apocryphal, but I don't know if it's true, but he had, he had this still, of a 10 by 8 black and white still of Clint Eastwood in Rawhide, and that he doodled uh, a beard on him and bigger shoulders and, you know, a Mexican-looking poncho and a hat pulled over his eyes um, and tried to rough him up a bit. I mean, remember that Clint Eastwood's image in Rawhide was was like Pat Boone or Ricky Nelson, you know, there he was in a check shirt. And in fact, he brought out a record uh, with this rather gentle tenor voice that he had, um, where they were trying to sort of launch him as a, as, as a cowboy singer. In fact, I think it's come out, uh, the, the album of Clint Eastwood's cowboy songs has been reissued from the late 50s. But, you know, he was the clean cut boy who, who he was the one who got the attractive girl while Gil Favor, the trail boss, just bossed everyone around. But, uh, that Leone sort of saw something in him if he was roughed up a bit. So he was sent the script. And uh, the, the problem with the scripts that were sent out was that they were very badly translated um, at that stage. They couldn't afford decent translations, which they could later. So they're absolutely full of hilarious things like, um, you know, we will go to the Hill of Boots, you know, and you think, hang on, what's that? Oh, Kaboot Hill, I see, uh, and, uh, and so on. So I think Clint Eastwood, it's remarkable that he agreed to do it because the script wasn't in a very good state. It was just translated in a very literal way from the Italian. And uh, he agreed to do it and, 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 and flew over. And in fact, um, Clint Eastwood, uh, 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 Sergio Leone wasn't at the airport when uh, Clint, Clint Eastwood arrived. He was met by a director called Mario Cayano, who was another uh, uh, director of um, Italian Spanish Westerns. And um, uh, it, they drove into Rome. And at that stage, East, uh, uh, Leone met him for the first time. And Leone had this story, uh, you know, that, uh, after The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, they, they, the two of them tended to badmouth each other a little bit. Uh, anyway, they, 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 you know, they'd had, they'd worked together three times, they didn't work again, and they weren't awfully complimentary about each other. And Leone said this, this rather funny thing. He said that I asked him what he, what he thought of uh, Clint Eastwood when, when he first met him. Uh, he'd, he'd landed at, uh, uh, at the Fumicino airport in Rome, had gone to the center of Rome, and he, he saw him for the first time in the flesh. What did he think? And uh, Leone, and he's used this line many, many times. He said, um, it is said, that Michelangelo looked at a block of stone and saw Moses. I looked at Clint Eastwood and saw a block of stone, <laughs> which is just what I wanted. And he wanted this rock hard sort of countenance that uh, doesn't talk very much, <coughs> excuse me, the strong silent type. Um, so uh, yeah, he wasn't by any means the first choice, but he was what they could afford. And um, Clint Eastwood wasn't allowed to make movies in, in America as part of his contract with Rawhide. Uh, but he was allowed to make movies in Europe, according to his contract with Rawhide. So he took a chance and came over to Italy, and the rest is history.
going back a, a, a little bit to what Chris said before about the soundtrack was by that time in the 60s too, um, if you had any vocals in the soundtrack, it was an opening song. And it was so refreshing for me when I first saw the Fistful of Dollars was the whistling of Alessandroni. That caught my ear too, that that was something yeah. I liked from the 50s, but they had done away with it basically by the 60s. So yes. that's yes. that's amazing. You get it in Gunfight at the OK Corral, don't you, where they bog. Yep, exactly. And, uh, and uh, you know, which is slightly reminiscent of what Morricone did, but as you say, it had, it had rather gone out and it was very good whistling. I did an interview with Alessandro and he said, um, who died actually a couple of years ago, but he, he said, uh, you know, where most people whistle, about 40% of their whistle is air. So you right. get this rather you get this rather reedy sound. But in his case, over 90% of it is whistle. He has this very piercing whistle when he whistles. And um, yep. that certainly comes over. And of course, it became part of the sound of spaghetti westerns. Let me ask you, this This is something that I, I find hard to believe. Or some people who are not old enough may remember or not remember that Leone's westerns were met with harsh criticism uh, when they were first released in the U.S., why do you think that was, and what do you think changed over the years that they're now revered and considered classics? Well, I think at the time uh, that people felt, you know, the Western was American, that, that, mm -hmm. uh, that two great art forms invented in the United States, jazz and the Western. Uh, and, you know, uh, you can't take that away from me. You know, it, 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 these were American... Uh, they were about American history, American traditions, American actors, American music, American landscapes. And how dare an Italian move a, come in and, um, uh, you know, and try and take it over? Uh, to which Leone replied, uh, you know, Fritz Lang was German. He made Rancho Notorious. William Wyler was French. He made The Big Country. Uh, John Ford was Irish. <laughs> he made all these cavalry movies. So he wasn't the first non-American who had uh, made, made Western movies, but he was the first to make them outside America. Uh, and I think it was a kind of proprietary thing, partly. And partly the style came as a hell of a shock. You know, I think in those days people associated the Western with uh, movies about history and movies about tradition. And the Italians were quite obviously making movies about movies. Now, Leone had never been to America when he made Fist for Dollars. <coughs> Excuse me. And uh, he'd never been to America, so his sole knowledge of the American West was either from books uh, borrowed from the American Information Center in Rome at the Via Veneto or from other movies. So these were films about films. Now, today, most movies are films about films. They're full of references to other films. They, they sort of wink at you and, and have all sorts of references to classic Hollywood movies and other movies and so on. And that's very commonplace. But in the mid-1960s, that was very, very rare. Films were thought to be about the real world. And here were a series of films about other movies. And I think people felt a bit threatened by that. Uh, so, yes, the, 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 the reviews in the United States weren't, weren't awfully um, complimentary. The irony is, of course, you know, dissolve for 50 or 60 years. <coughs> and, um, you know, Italian Westerns are now more fashionable than American Westerns, which is such an irony, you know, that, uh, you know, Hollywood keeps trying to relaunch the Western, but it never, it never quite leads to a new genre. It, it, they, they, they become one-offs, really. But uh, the Italians, the clothes, the music, Clint Eastwood, the Almerian landscape, Morricone, all of that is much, much more fashionable, I think, than, uh, than the American Western. So Leone didn't live to see it, but wherever he is, I think he must be smiling because the whole thing has reversed, really, in the last 60 years. But, but that's partly because movies have become more about pure style and less about the real world, you know? And so people don't want their Westerns to be about the real world necessarily. Look at Heaven's Gate. You know, Heaven's Gate, incredible research. They got the hats right, they got the clothes right, they got the faces right. As somebody said, you know, um, it's all very well to have detail, but do you need to know the blood group of the horses? You know, it was incredibly detailed and nobody went to see it. Uh, they want myth, they want adventure, they want excitement, uh, and, uh, and they want style. 
So, you know, in a way, the Italian Westerns had more going for them, for the modern cinema audience, uh, than the American ones. Uh, Tarantino, when I interviewed him, said that, uh, you know, whenever, whenever he got in film studies courses, he, all these young people who want to become directors, he'd show them classic Hollywood movies, and they showed no interest in them at all. Till you get to Leone and Corbucci, and suddenly they see the birth of modern cinema, the birth of the jukebox movie, where the music is written in advance, and the movie is constructed around the music, the birth of a hero who's no longer a crusader, but is a kind of style statement, the modern action hero, uh, the birth of rather hip soundtrack. And suddenly the students go, yeah, yeah, let's watch those 1960s movies. They see them as the birth of modern action cinema, whereas everything before then rather bores them. To, now that, that may not be a particularly good thing, but I think it's very interesting that, that these films uh, really pointed the way towards the future of action cinema. I want to ask you about Carlo Simi. Uh, mm. One of the best things about the Leone movies are the sets. Mm. And he was a, he was the number one guy that designed a lot of the sets like El Paso. Yeah. And uh, I saw recently even he got involved in the um, uh, Indian, uh, no, uh, cave, uh, shoot, in... Um, once Upon a Time in the West, where Henry meets yes, Mr. Building, Shooter. Building the Indian Village. Yeah, yes, exactly. I, I thought that that was a, a real... So Indian, did I. You know, yeah, I, know, I saw thinking. people with ladders up there and working on them. And, I mean, I there may have been something there at one time that they added to, but I That's didn't right. know that he actually worked on that, too. The yeah, cliff, sort of cliff dwellings. Yeah, it was a sort of crevice yep. in the cliff near Cayenta. And, in fact, yeah. I, I spent the summer uh, exploring Monument Valley and... Uh, that part of uh, the location of Once Upon a Time. And I looked for this thing. I couldn't find it anywhere. I found this crevice, but uh, no, he built the village. Yes, he's a key part of the, the team. You know, people say the team that made the Leone film successful, Leone, Morricone, Eastwood. Absolutely true. But they should add Carlo Simi's name to the list. You're quite right, Tom. Uh, you know, he was an architect by training. Uh, he designed one or two films before uh, Fistful of Dollars. Uh, but uh, Leone chose him and he had this ability to to do larger than life buildings that were just like the larger than life atmosphere of the whole movie and um, I, I was really pleased because when I did my book on Once Upon a Time in the West I got to know the Simi family in Rome and uh, they have a lovely collection of his drawings uh, uh, both his technical drawings but also his more impressionistic drawings his atmosphere drawings of the sets that he did, and he was a very talented man, I think. I mean, especially, I mean, he did, he not only did uh, uh, Leone films, he did Django uh, and uh, assorted other uh, Western movies. You see his name cropping up on, uh, uh, you know, the films by other directors as well as Leone, but uh, yeah, he's a, he's a key figure. But I think generally people don't rate the role of production designers enough in their, you know, there's lots of books on directors and, actors and writers and cinematographers but there's very few books written about production designers and i think they're a key part of the team i did a book um not not with the westerns but uh, i did two books with ken adam the guy that designed the first seven of the bond films and you know you cannot imagine those films without the missile inside the volcano or uh, you know the Aston Martin that that, that uh, fires you know machine guns out of the out of the headline. You know that those the sets are integral to those films and they're very much part of the experience. And I feel the same way about Carlo Simi's role. By the way, they were friends, Ken Adam and Carlo Simi. They knew each other very well. But uh, uh, I feel the same way about Carlo Simi that that these larger than life Western villages. Well, it's a mixture of real villages in Almeria. You mentioned that scene in. Uh, at the beginning of A Fistful of Dollars, Tom, where they come across these ad this adobe village. That's a real village in uh, San Jose, okay, and, yep. and etc. So you had the real villages, but then you get the bank of El Paso or the, the street in El Paso, or and these are Carlos Simi sets, some of which are still standing. And then by the time of Once Upon a Time in the West, this wonderful set of Sweetwater, the, the ranch house, which is absolutely vast, and I, I made a great discovery. I couldn't understand why, why it was all made of wood. You know, it's the same with John Ford films, that uh, in the middle of Monument Valley, you've got a ranch made of wood. Where the hell did they get the wood from? Yeah, you know, right. 
I mean, you know, <laughs> it's made miles away. Um, yeah. But so why, why, why have a, a house entirely made of wood in the middle of the Almeria Desert? Well, the answer is that Orson Welles made a film, uh, Falstaff, Chimes at Midnight, which finishes on the Battle of Shrewsbury, a medieval battle where everyone has wooden pikes and wooden stakes and there's wood absolutely everywhere and they left the wood behind <laughs> when, when when the production left Almeria so they had this wonderful job lot of wood ah oh, let's build this huge ranch house so that's how Sweetwater happened and uh, it's about three times bigger than it should be you know it's three stories high it's got a slanting roof it's the biggest ranch house you've ever seen in a but it works because everything is larger than life everything's magnified and uh, you know the sets are part of it so yeah, I was, I was so pleased. I managed to interview Carlos Simi at a film festival in Montpellier in the south of France before he died. He died of, uh, he, was, he was quite poorly when I interviewed him. He had, a, he had throat cancer. Um, but he, um, it was great. And he was so thrilled that somebody was talking to him because nobody had shown any interest in, in the work he did uh, on these sets. I think it's sad that he didn't design uh, Duck You Sucker, you know, a fistful of dynamite, but he was busy doing other things. So that's the one of the Leone films that he, he you don't get the Carlo Simi designs. But uh, in the others, yeah, they, 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 they are a, a key part of it. And he was part of the team, you know, that uh, when they were planning the locations and how do you turn the words on the page into the movie experience, he was there just as Morricone was writing the music in advance. Uh, uh, Simi was there working out how to do these extraordinary, surreal Western sets. And, uh, right. so, um, and T Quentin Tarantino completely agrees with me. He thinks it's really important. Because the other thing about Simi is he also designed the costumes. And that's extremely rare for a production designer to design the costumes. So all those long canvas coats yep. and pantos and all those very just rather stylish coats you get, that's Simi as well. Speaking of design uh, Christopher and as, and uh, let's see as as well as um, locations. I want to stay on that uh, theme for a second. Your latest book well, came out a couple of years ago. Once upon a time in the West, the <coughs> the shooting of a masterpiece. You yeah. share a wealth of never seen before documents, designs, and photographs. Now, having already written three books about Sergio Leone and. Uh, and I guess his films, what motivated you to do yet a fourth book, which basically covers the film shot by shot. Yeah. And I'm, I'm, I'm actually curious to where as you stumbled upon these newly unpublished artifacts that, that previously were unpublished in your other books. Yeah, no, it was, um, I was very lucky actually. I mean, I had quite a lot of material. When I did the Leone biography, I interviewed uh, all his associates uh, and the Leone family were very helpful to me in opening doors to find and meet these people in Rome. And I did lots of interviews and I only used bits of the interviews in the biography. So I had on tape uh, interviews with all the key people who were involved in Once Upon a Time in the West. Then uh, I, I, I developed a relationship with the Cineteca di Bologna, which is the uh, Italian film archive in Bologna in northern Italy. And they have the archive of um, Angelo Novi, who was the, photogra the, the set photographer and the stills photographer on uh, uh, Good, the Bad and the Ugly, uh, uh, Once Upon a Time in the West and Once Upon a Time in America. So they have this vast collection of negatives and positives of photos of the shooting of those films. And they very kindly agreed that uh, I, I could use them for the book. So that was great. I had the interviews, I had the photos. And then I had a real piece of luck a young research student who was researching a PhD on the real identity of all these actors who hid under pseudonyms in, uh, in Italy in, in, in the mid, uh, you know, a, a lot of the actors developed either Italian or American pseudonyms uh, and in fact came from all over the world and he was fascinated by this phenomenon. So he was studying that in the government film archives in Rome, sorry, in the government archives in Rome, administrative archives. There's no catalogue or anything, but he was going through um, when when Italian films were uh, uh, were made in in the mid 1960s. By an Italian law, if they used a certain number of Italian actors or Italian technicians or uh, uh, it, it, people in front of the camera or behind the camera, they were entitled to a government grant. 
And a lot of film companies uh, claimed that the actors were all Italian when actually half of them came from Uruguay. And so this chap was working out, you know, who was really Italian and who wasn't. But any film that got a government grant or was eligible for a government grant had to report to the government its progress. Anyway, he was researching in this archive. There isn't a catalogue. And one day he found this envelope and written on it, Cera una volta il West, once upon a time in the West. So he opened the envelope and inside it, there was the shooting schedule. There were all the contracts. There was a day by day report on the filming of this film because uh, they had to tell the government what they'd been up to and how many Italian technicians, how many Italian actors, was it shot in Italy? Was it uh, in, in Cinecitta in an interior or was it in Spain for the exterior? And all these information day by day had to be reported to the Italian government if you were going to be eligible for a grant. And so he got in touch with me and said, you know, are you interested? I said, am I? God, it is so rare to find primary material about these films. I mean, actually, as it were, manuscript material. So um, he, he uh, 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 photocopied them and, I, and sent them to me. And it enabled me to reconstruct the entire shooting schedule of Once Upon a Time in the West. Uh, and also a, a lot of stuff in the introduction, all about the, um, all about the contract uh, that Leone had, which proved conclusively that you know, he agreed with Paramount that he'd produced quite a short film and then produced quite a long film. And, uh, and, and that was really the shape of things to come with Leone. He kept agreeing to produce a two hour movie and, and, and then uh, delivering a four hour movie or a three and a half hour movie or a three and a quarter hour movie. And the result was that everything was cut uh, 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 by right, actually, by the studio when the film uh, opened in the United States. So that, that, that was another story. So all this wonderful primary material. So the photos, the interviews, the primary, I suddenly thought, I've got a book here. And then the publisher said, well, in order to, for a younger readership, can you get Quentin Tarantino involved? And uh, by dint of uh, 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 various uh, uh, various routes, I spent a lovely day with Quentin Tarantino interviewing him. And that turned into the introduction to the book. And it was, it, I mean, if you'd been a fly on the wall, it was the most extraordinary afternoon. We were buffing each other into submission. I mean, he knows a hell of a lot about Spaghetti Westerns. I know quite a lot. And we were kind of competing with, you know, mm -hmm. referring to even more obscure movies, you know, and who was the second baddie on the left in... Uh, <laughs> In Navajo Joe, you know, oh, don't you know that? You know, so, and we were buffing each other. It was the most extraordinary conversation uh, in, in Tarantino's cinema, and that turned into the introduction. So it was great. Everything fell into place. Um, unfortunately, he hasn't found an envelope on any of the other Leone films, because like, immediately I said, well, can you find the good, the bad, and the ugly envelope, or the a few dollars more envelope? But because it's not catalogued, there are just thousands and thousands of administrative documents in brown envelopes. And you know, one day someone may find things, but uh, you know, you, you, you'd find it by accident rather than by design. So, uh, so far we haven't found any more material uh, from that source, but uh, no, it was great. It enabled me to dig a lot deeper than I had before uh, from the Italian sources. And uh, I was very pleased about that. And I, I got a couple of extra interviews, which I, I hadn't done, but with the assistant director, Giancarlo Santi, and one or two other people, which I did specially. And, um, so I'm, I'm, you know, it came out pretty well, I think. And the pictures are lovely. Angelo Novi's stills are really beautiful of the, the filming of it. It really makes it come alive, I think. Just a little bit of trivia here, and he, Christopher knows this. Angelo Novi was in The Good, The Bad, and The Ugly. <clears throat> he plays mm. a padre at the mission mm. when uh, Tuco takes Clint there to recover. He's the padre mm. that helps him take him out of the carriage into, yeah. the, uh, into the mission. So that's yeah. who Angelo Novi is. Yep. Wow. Yes. <laughs> and also, Carlos Simi plays the bank manager of El Paso. In That's right. right. We can uh, switch, uh, I guess, course for a little bit and talk about an actor who I personally don't think gets his due. I mean, he is a legend, but he gets, I guess, lost in the Clint argument. But the great Lee Van Cleef mm. brings so much to a, for a few yeah. dollars more and the good, the bad, and the ugly. Uh, I mean, he's one of my favorite actors, as well as a lot of uh, our fans. Can you tell us uh, your opinion on him and uh, how great you think he is? Oh, it's great. Oh, I think he's, he's amazing. I, I, he, um, and it shows, I think, uh, Leone, and I mentioned Leone's encyclopedic knowledge of American movies. And he remembered, you know, High Noon and uh, The Tin Star and Gunfight at the OK Corral and all those movies where 
uh, Lee Van Cleef usually got killed in the second reel. He was the, the second baddie on the left, and he loved the way he moved. Uh, you probably know that Colonel Mortimer in For a Few Dollars More was originally to be played by Lee Marvin, who pulled out in order to make Cat Baloo about five weeks before the shooting was to begin. So they only had a problem, his second lead, he didn't know who, but he remembered, he had a long memory for this. And um, he once quoted to me uh, this rather wonderful quote from Mark Twain. He said, uh, Mark Twain wrote, uh, in, in Europe, you're remembered for your most famous work. In America, you're remembered for your latest work. And that he said, the thing is that in Europe, we remember these actors from films of long ago, long after they've ceased to be superstars. And in fact, Lee Van Cleef's career was in decline. I think one of the movies he made just before uh, For A Few Dollars More was How the West Was Won, where he has one line. He's a river pirate and he stands there uh, at Walter Brennan's uh, uh, river pirate uh, uh, hideout and says, they're coming. That's it. <laughs> and he didn't even get into the uh, credits. And, you know, you look at the souvenir program for How the West Was Won, he's not in there. So uh, his, his, his career was in decline in a way, but the Italians have long memories. They remembered those movies. They remembered the way he moved. They weren't so worried about his voice because of course they don't record direct sound in Italy. They recorded afterwards. So that could all be sorted out in, in post-production. So he goes over to Italy with a suitcase full of dollars and, um, and, uh, and casts Lee Van Cleef as Colonel Mortimer, which led to this extraordinary career in Italy where Lee Van Cleef became, when Clint Eastwood went back to America, became, you know, probably the biggest star, American star in Italian westerns in lots of, you know, the, the Grand Duel or, um, you know, there are so many films, The Big Gun Down, uh, the, the, the Tonino Valeri film, etc. cetera. Um, and uh, uh, so, yes, and I, I, he was just right. He, he, he was a very patient actor. You have to be patient because, you know, you, you just have a guide track when you're making these Italian films. So everyone speaks in their own language and it's all dubbed afterwards. So you've got to be very patient and you don't really get a full performance until in post-production where you go to the dubbing studio or the looping studio and put your voice in and everything. So he had to be very, very patient about uh, how his performance would be sort of constructed around him. It's a very different kind of acting to, to method acting and uh, you know, uh, uh, acting from inside. Uh, which is more more the American style of the 1960s, and so and he carries it off. Fantastic! He's got the most wonderful face. He walks in this very distinctive way, largely because he'd hurt his leg very badly in a car accident, so he has a slight limp. He hated riding horses. He was frightened of riding horses, according to Leone. Uh, so he had to have uh, uh, Andalusian circus horses <laughs> to uh, for him to ride, so that he could trust them and they wouldn't throw him. Do you remember in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, where as the bad, he arrives at the beginning at the farm yep. where there's a well yeah. and all this, there's this high stepping horse that looks it out as though it's come out of, uh, you know, a magic circus. Um, it's a sort of, it's obviously a circus horse that he's trot, trot, trot and he's lifting his feet. You expect him to be in the big top uh, and Lee Van Cleef looking quite relaxed sitting in the saddle um, because he was, he was very, Paranoid about horses bolting because he he damaged his leg and he, and uh, he didn't he you know he couldn't have coped, so all of that and the other thing which is rather wonderful is that if you in the good the bad and the ugly one of the close ups, now we're getting really detailed now we're getting to the blood group of the horses right um, as his hand Lee Van Cleef's hand creeps round to his gun you notice that the end of his finger is missing, and. At the opening of an exhibition I did at the Autry Museum called Once Upon a Time in Italy, a few, Tom will remember, a few, in 2004, uh, I met Mrs. Van Cleef and I said, forgive me asking, but how did Lee Van Cleef lose the end of his finger? And I was expecting, you know, some, uh, he got into a gunfight or he got into a knife fight. He was making a doll's house for one of his children and he cut his finger off with a Stanley <laughs> knife. And I thought that was so sweet sure. that uh, Mr. Mr. Bad cut his finger off while making a doll's house for a child. I thought that was rather nice. Speaking of great character actors or stars <laughs> at that time, uh, let's talk about Rod Steiger for a minute uh, yeah. and Duck You Sucker. Is it true that uh, Rod and Sergio Leone almost came to blows on the set? Well, so Le Leone always dined out on stories about how, because uh, Rod Steiger came from this method tradition 
and was fascinated by motivation and uh, and so on. But um, he claimed that Steiger was overacting all the time and didn't get it that minimalism was the thing that you you know the voice is going to be put on afterwards and uh, you know it's it's the visuals of the performance that count. So his performance was too big, and that he kept doing take after take after take in order to exhaust uh, Rod Steiger, so that by take number twenty three maybe he'd get a performance out of him. That's what he always said. And, and I sort of believed that. And when I wrote the biography, I, I, I transcribed some of these stories about how the two of them came from such different traditions and they argued on the set. But then um, I did an interview with Martin Scorsese, who remembered going to a lecture by Rod Steiger just after Steiger had made a duck you sucker, a fistful of dynamite, a lecture on film acting. And Rod Steiger spent the lecture saying what a wonderful director Leone was because he gave the actor so much space and so much charisma that every close up, extreme close up, you remembered, you remembered that actor's face forever. And that he was a one, that he understood actors and he was a one, he was very complimentary to actors and that it was a great experience making the movie. So I don't know who to believe that Rod Steiger at the time uh, was full of praise for the way Leone uh, um, gave gave the actors so much charisma in, in, in their parts that they almost felt diminished when they appeared in anything else. Uh, and yet Leone was saying that, uh, you know, he wasn't happy with Steiger's performance. So I'm not sure where the, the truth probably lies in the middle. I think they probably did squabble because they're very, very different traditions of acting. Uh, whereas Coburn came from a tradition that uh, Leone absolutely recognized. He did his job, he arrived on time, he walked very gracefully, he understood dubbing, he moved very slowly, you know, he, he, he had a, a twinkle in his eye. He was the perfect Leone actor and it, they got on very well, whereas Steiger was emoting all the time and, uh, and so on. So, um, so I'm not quite sure where the truth lies there, but uh, it was very sweet of Rod Steiger to say, uh, you know, and, and uh, um, in fact, um, Woody Strode said the same thing uh, in his autobiography, Cold, uh, uh, Gold Dust, where he said um, uh, that, uh, uh, you know, he'd appeared in, also, he'd Sergeant Rutledge. He'd appeared in um, the Professionals and lots of films. But that, and but the opening sequence of Once Upon a Time in the West, where he gets the absolute close-up on his face, and him standing there on that uh, deserted railway station, had gave more punch to his performance and was more memorable as a performance than anything he'd ever done anywhere else that he might have had a bigger part in the professionals he might have had a bigger part in Rutledge but that was so punchy and even though he was killed before the credit titles finished almost uh, that was the one that stuck in people's minds so people were uh, you know whatever the atmosphere on the set they were very complimentary with what Leone did for their careers and of course Woody Strode went back to Italy and and made several Italian westerns as a result. Staying with uh, Duck You Sucker for one last second is it true and I'm fascinated by who could have, who would have played what, who would have directed what? Is it true Sam Peckinpah almost directed Duck You Sucker? Well, he was considered uh, uh, the first. Uh, uh, Leone, after he'd made the three on the trot, uh, uh, Fist for Dollars, Few Dollars More, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly, wanted a rest, I think. And also, The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly had been so successful, he, he had a slight crisis of confidence about whether he could do it again. Uh, having done three in a row. So he wanted to produce the film to start with uh, from the script by Sergio Donati and Luciano Vincenzoni. And his first choice of director was Peter Bogdanovich. Uh, he'd seen Targets, Bogdanovich's first film, a uh, first feature film, and was impressed by it. And so Bogdanovich flew over, they didn't get on. They didn't get on and, and both have written articles about how they rowed and they just didn't see eye to eye. Bogdanovich is a very different kind of filmmaker to Leone. So at that stage, there was talk of Peckinpah and Peckinpah was in London and he met Leone and they thought, wouldn't it be great on the marquee to say a Sergio Leone production, a Sam Peckinpah film, just associating the two names after the Wild Bunch would be fantastic. But uh, it, it, never, it, never, it never came to pass. And oh. so the third choice was um, Giancarlo Santi, who'd been the uh, assistant director on uh, Once More Time in the West and had been promised uh, a film uh, afterwards as, as a director. And he actually started pre-production and shot a couple of days. But the actors and United Artists insisted on the real man. They wanted Leone. They wanted his name. 
uh, you know, that was part of the excitement of making the movie. So Leone took it over and, um, and, and, and directed it at quite short notice, actually. But uh, no, it's quite interesting to fantasize about what would have happened if uh, Sam Peckinpah had made it. The other thing was the casting, you know, that originally the IRA man, the Irishman played by James Coburn, was originally to be played by Malcolm McDowell because Leone was very impressed by If, the film that McDowell was in, and uh, uh, wanted, uh, you know, as a matter of historical fact, a lot of the Irish IRA men were yeah, very young men, aged about 18, and he wanted a young actor to play that part, and he wanted the Mexican to be played by Eli Wallach. In fact, he promised the part to Eli Wallach. And many, many years later, I was at the Taumina Film Festival in Sicily, and Eli Wallach was getting an award, and I had a chance to spend a bit of time with him. And uh, <coughs> he said he had not spoken to the Leone family between Dakusaka and this Taumina Film Festival, which was in the 1990s, because he was so upset. He'd been promised the part of Juan Miranda, and uh, he'd made all sorts of arrangements to appear in it. And at the last minute, they said, no, sorry, Rod Steiger's got the part. And he was so upset, he broke off all contact with Leone. And, and threatened to sue him. <laughs> Sorry? Threatened to sue him. No, well, he did. He threatened to sue him. And uh, apparently Leone, Leone replied, well, get in line. You know, everyone else wants to sue me as well. You know, it all got a bit distasteful. Anyway, at, at Tarmina, he embraced Carla Leone, Mrs. Leone and the family, and they made their peace. It was rather nice. And uh, uh, after all those years, there were no hard feelings. But yeah, no, he. It, it's interesting to speculate again about, you know, a Peckinpah production with Eli Wallach and uh, Malcolm McDowell. That would have been a very different movie, I think. Your next book, Speculations of the Spaghetti Western. Yes, exactly. The movies they didn't quite make. Right. No, well, I'm fast. I'm, I'll, I'll co-write that with you if you allow me. Um, well, I'll, I'll tell you something that's turned up, uh, which is quite interesting in terms of movies that were never made. Um, you know, Fellini made this in this portmanteau film of Edgar Allan Poe stories called Histoire Extraordinaire uh, uh, of Edgar Allan Poe. You, you know, one with Terence Stamp. In it. I don't know if you know it, but... Oh, Fellini I do. To Toby Dammit. Toby Dammit. And in it, uh, 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 Terence Stamp plays Toby Dammit. He goes to... He's, he does a press conference at the airport and says he's over to make a Western and it's going to be a mixture of uh, Fred Zinnemann and Piero della Francesca and all this sort of thing, and it's going to be an Italian Western. What's emerged is that Fellini spent two days at Elios Studios in Rome and shot a spaghetti Western. There was to be, at that point, a flashback, to, sorry, a flash forward to uh, Terence Stamp as an actor in a spaghetti Western. And uh, Fellini actually shot for two days a parody spaghetti western and the footage has turned up apparently someone was telling me in rome so that's quite exciting there's a fellini italian western that we haven't seen so talking about the i think the end all of what could have been should have been um i read in your book about clint eastwood uh turning down being in the cameo at the beginning of once upon a time in the west with yeah. lee van cleef and eli wallach as the other two hired guns, but Lee and Eli agreed to it, but not Clint. How amazing would that opening have been? <laughs> it would have been great, wouldn't it? With Clint Eastwood in a poncho, uh, Lee Van Cleef all dressed in black, and uh, Eli Wallach still shouting and, uh, and, and, and yelling all sorts of uh, 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 obscenities at the camera. It would have been wonderful, all sitting there, passing the time as the train was two hours late. Yes, it, it's interesting because I mean, Leone absolutely swore that this was the case. And uh, Clint has, has said he, he doesn't think that he, he was offered that part. But I think what might have happened is that uh, <coughs> Leone went over to see Clint Eastwood to persuade him and told him the story of Once Upon a Time in the West. And, um, uh, you know, it, it took him about 35 minutes to do the opening sequence. And Clint Eastwood thought, wow, what, you know, where's this film going? Uh, it, it seems to be very slow and uh, it doesn't sound like my sort of movie. And there may have been a translation problem that Leone thought he was offering Clint Eastwood the part and Clint Eastwood thought he was being offered harmonica because he has said that he was offered the Charles Bronson part, harmonica. But that's difficult to imagine. It's such a different character to Clint Eastwood, but uh, maybe that's the case. Anyway, it's a wonderful fantasy. Spaghettis that might have been. I right. think we should have a... We should have a season. I always wondered why they just didn't say yes when Sergio asked them. 
It's weird. I mean, I suspect that with Fonda, when he was sent uh, a script for the Dollars films, I suspect it was badly translated and not very well presented. And, uh, and I don't think his agent understood what was going on. Whereas by the time of Once Upon a Time in the West, um, you know, the, the script was properly translated. Uh, uh, you know, they commissioned a, 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 a translation that's actually very like the, uh, the final dialogue, and it was beautifully presented. And also, uh, Henry Fonda phoned his friend Eli Wallach and said, should I do it? And Wallach said, yeah, of course you should. I had a wonderful time making The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. You, 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 you must do this movie. So by then they could talk to each other about it, and there was a kind of tradition emerging. Bronson, I don't know. I found an extraordinary quote from Bronson when I was doing the um, Once Upon a Time in the West book, where he did an interview. He didn't do many interviews. He was a man of very few words, but he did an interview with a French journal. And they asked him, they loved Once Upon a Time in the West. And they said, uh, have you seen the movie? He said, no, I never see the movies that I'm in. End of, end of question. He never saw Once Upon a Time in the West. A uh, couple things here. One of my most memorable memories from... Uh, the good, the bad, the ugly, when you talked about Lee Van Cleef. And it's the same thing when he arrives at Stevens Ranch, when he gets off his horse, and I'm sure it's because of his leg injury, Chris, he stands mm. up straight and yes. then comes down like he's a, he's a royal king arriving yes. at, the, you know, at the palace. It's just yes. so memorable the way he gets off that horse. Yes, uh, yes, yes. The other, the other thing is I thought that I had heard that the reason that they finally settled on Steiger was the producer's or the production company insisted on him because he had made um in the heat of the night yeah in the heat of the night and he was so hot <laughs> that they wanted to use him instead of uh eli yeah. and again, again like you i can't imagine eli in that role talk about trying to to keep someone down after you've seen him play tuco would be almost yeah. impossible Yes, exactly, exactly. Yes, it might have happened quite late in the day. Uh, certainly, United Artists wanted a major star that would that would work in the in the in the United States. And I'm not sure the movie. Tom, you probably know more than I do, but I don't think it was that successful in the states, was it? Ducky Sucker. I, I mean, first of all, the title change, which is always a bit suspicious. When they had you, to change you... the name of the movie to A Fistful of Dynamite. Exactly. To, to bring it back into it. the Leone family, yes. Yeah, I don't think it did nearly as well as the, as the other two. That film yeah. grows on me, actually. The more I see it, the more me I see too. in it. Me yeah. too. And like you said, you have to see the full version. Yeah. Uh, uh, Coburn blows himself up, and you get a close-up of Steiger just uh, before uh, the, He says, what about me? What about me? But the part you know, that, I, that, that, yeah. that I'm talking about is the is the revision backwards to the trio at the tree yeah. and it yes. explains the whole thing. She really <coughs> didn't like Coburn as much as she liked the yeah. other guy. Yeah. Warbeck. Yeah. yeah. yeah exactly. um, one, one other question for you is I've always thought that once Sergio got popular, like after the good, the bad and the ugly, the films became further and further apart was he felt he had to top himself. Yes. He was Sergio Leone now. He couldn't go and do this movie because uh, I, I got to make it bigger and better. Yeah, yeah, I think that's true. And uh, yeah, no, I think that's true. And, and I mean, he did make quite a few movies as a producer, you know, sure. in the in the 70s and 80s. But uh, yeah, and uh, and turned down. I mean, we know he turned down The Godfather. Uh, well, I'm, and, guessing and as, I'm guessing as a director where his name yep. goes up. They're directed by Sergio Leone. Producer, you see his name in there, you go, okay. He's a producer yeah. on this, but we want to see yeah. something directed by him. Yeah, I think he had a sort of crisis of confidence about, you know, he was on a roll. Could he keep going? And, right. uh, you know, in a way, the movies were getting, in some ways, were getting better and better, certainly more and more complicated and certainly more and bigger, bigger. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah, he, he um, Bogdanovich is convinced that he, he was uh, basically quite a timid man underneath and that uh, he was worried that he couldn't keep it up. Right. Gotcha. <laughs> Excuse me, can I just get some more water? Sure, Keep talking. Please do. Keep I'll, talking. I'll, I'll drag out the question. Uh, okay. okay, I was going to say that I think we're very lucky that we even got Once Upon a Time in the West, because if you have to read these books by, uh, by Sir Christopher Frayling and the articles to actually find out the behind the scenes of what's happening, and what I am referring to is I was mentioned earlier that Leone was suffering from dollars trilogy burnout mm -hmm. uh, since he made the three westerns in three years which is incredible 
And he wanted to get away from the genre. And so he decided he wanted to make his original gangsters concept, Once Upon a Time in America, which he actually was able to uh, many years later. But the studio said, uh, you do the Western version first. So he said, okay. <laughs> so luckily, uh, he brought that concept. He said, if you make the, first, the Western, well, you can make the gangster film. Yeah, yeah. And it was a very different Western, wasn't it? I mean, I, they thought they were going to get, you know, Son of the Good, the Bad and the Ugly, I think, uh, to keep the dollars theme going. And they got a very different movie. You know, instead of his usual script writers, uh, Sergio Donati and others, he, he uses Bertolucci and Argento, who right. write the original story. So he's going for more youthful uh, 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 script writers. And it's, uh, it's a very, it, less of a Mediterranean raucous sort of western and more a kind of funeral dirge for his love for a great american genre that they don't make them like that anymore so it refers to every western you've ever seen you know i did a list in the book of uh, all the references to um, <laughs> Hollywood i was westerns. just going to say that's so interesting because now when i watch it i look for those scenes from other yeah. movies that he has redone and added yeah. to once upon a time in the west Absolutely. And, and, you know, and the people confirmed that's what they're doing. They watched in those days, 16 millimeter and 35 millimeter prints of these films. And, uh, and, and you know, there were key films like Johnny Guitar by Nicholas right. Ray and The Searchers by John Ford, but lots, lots of quite obscure ones. <coughs> and it was a very different thing. They, they, were, they, were, they were saying how much they loved the Western as a fairy tale, Once Upon a Time, and colliding it with American history in the West. And so, you know, when, when he produced the film for Paramount, I think they, they weren't sure what they'd got, really. They hoped for the good, the bad, and the ugly, and what they got was an extraordinary, you know, uh, two-and-a-half-hour, three-hour art film about the Western. Uh, and so they didn't know how to release it. They cut out 20 minutes in order to get an extra screening each day and so on. But it's, uh, it is a great movie, I think, in, in all sorts of different ways. Uh, even the music's very different, I think, to the, to the Dollars films. You know, it's more, yes. it's more symphonic and uh, nearer an American Western, in a way, Jill's theme. You know, da, da, well, you, da, you've da, mentioned da. it before, and it, to me, too. My favorite part of that film with the music is when she goes through the train station into Flag, Flagstone, and that m music soars yeah. as yeah. the camera raises over the, yeah. the roof on the crane exactly the timing of the crane exactly oh. with the music which of course they could do with the music written in advance um, I, mean, I, I did some interviews with with morricone whom i got to know actually in fact um i introduced morricone on the stage of the royal albert hall in london on his mm, um, lucky uh, you. Uh, 80th birthday uh and you know he never played in the concerts the early dollars themes. He, he, he did The Good, The Bad and The Ugly, which he rearranged for concert, you, where the clarinet plays the part of the coyote, you know, the coyote howl, you know. So he ecstasy turned it into... Gold. Yeah, and The Ecstasy of Gold, exactly. Uh, but he never did Fist for Dollars and A Few Dollars More, or the Alessandro, Alessandroni, or the, or the Stratocaster thing. So when I introduced him, I was a bit naughty. He was standing on the stage next to me at the Albert Hall, and I, I, uh, I stood at the microphone and whistled the main theme from Fritz Rollo Dollars. And I said, that's the, last, that's the last you're gonna hear of that tonight. <laughs> and uh, he sort of glared at me. But anyway, we remained friends, but the audience loved it. They applauded like mad because uh, that's what they wanted to see. I couldn't understand it. He had a, he had a strange, um, slightly s snobbish attitude towards his early film scores, you know, which I love, that gypsy sound, the mariachi trumpet, the, the slightly rough guitar, uh, Alessandro's whistling, I love that sound, you know, which he never got in concert. It was too, too tame, too, too well-mannered, too symphonic. Uh, but anyway, uh, so at least they got a little bit of the of, of Fistful of Dollars and, uh, and, the, and the audience loved it. But, it's, um, but, but what were we talking about? I've forgotten why you, oh yes, Morricone. The opening scene of Once Upon a Time in the West, he told me that, um, you know, he did in fact write music for that scene with the three gunfighters waiting at the deserted railway station for the train that's two hours late. And um, he wrote some music, but it didn't work. And one night he went to a concert. Uh, in fact, he was playing in a concert. He, 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 he was part of a avant-garde music group called Nuova Consonanza, 
at that time, where they did all sorts of musical experiments with natural sounds, you know, uh, a song for typewriter or, or you know, all, all this sort of thing. And uh, they, they were performing in the first half of the concert. In the second half of the concert, after the interval, the audience came back into the auditorium in Florence and um, a man uh, started climbing a ladder which was attached to the circle in the theater, the dress circle. So he goes up the ladder and he had a microphone in his hand. And as he went up the ladder, the ladder was making squeaking noises. And everyone kept talking, thinking he must be a workman from the opera house or the music or the concert hall. <coughs> and um, uh, eventually after about 10 minutes, they realized this was the concert. And that the sounds that the ladder were making was this avant-garde musical experiment, a uh, school of John Cage. And there was a bit of a scandal in the papers. The, the audience felt sort of got out. Anyway, that night, Morricone phoned Leo and he said, why don't you make the sequence instead of music, amplified natural sounds. So you've got uh, a windmill that needs oiling. You've got a fly buzzing. You've got a door creaking. You've got a telegraph going tap, tap, tap. You've got someone pulling his knuckles. And you make a symphony of natural sounds like that man with the ladder and the microphone. And that's exactly what they did. It's like a 10 minute piece of performance art, I think. And uh, as Morricone said, it's the best piece of music he never wrote. Oh. And, and it's wonderful. I mean, the, the, the way, and of course, you can do that if you don't use natural sound that you, you know, you record it mute with a guide track. And then when you get into the uh, editing room, you really start working and layering the sound in retrospect. And you can choose the sounds and make them as loud or as soft or as artificial or as natural as you like. And it, it's an extraordinary, I think the, the soundtrack of that pre credit sequence in Once Upon a Time in the West is quite extraordinary. You know, the, this, this sort of, uh, well, symphony for natural sounds. And it's so sinister and so clever. I don't know if you agree, Tom. Well, I agree. I love the way they added the uh, credits too, when they bang the door closed, they put that old man in the yeah. vault, you know, as, as uh, a, a name comes down as pro producer, editor, whatever, you know, they did it yeah. very well, put it together. Right. Yeah. Just taking a break from Leone for a second, what are some of your favorite non-Leone Westerns and what is it about them that you like? Boy. Well, I love The Big Silence. Um, I, 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 I love the Morricone score in that, but uh, I like the unusual setting in the what? snow, in the Dolomites in Northern Italy. Um, mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, a real baddie played by Klaus Kinski. You mentioned Kinski in your credits, and uh, he plays a real baddie. And, uh, um, uh, I, 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 this, this, and, and, and also, you know, if you've got a film that's dubbed, what a great idea to have the lead actor has had his throat shot away and he can't talk at all. Yes, <laughs> uh, yes. Saves, saves a fortune on dubbing. So you can have a French right. actor and he doesn't have to say anything. Uh, no, I love The Big Silence um, of the Corbuches. The other one, I, I like Navajo Joe, actually, uh, um, uh, of, the, of, of the early Corbuches. Um, I like um, Solima, the, the big gun down, mm. um, in its full version. Uh, it makes much, much more sense. I mean, in England, it was released at, uh, you know, about 85 minutes. It had about 20 minutes cut from it. It made no sense at all. But I think that's that's a, that's a good film and introduced the character of Cuchillo, you know, Thomas Millian, this uh, right. charismatic sort of peasant character who appeared in, in, in lots of films. I love that. There's another Corbucci that isn't talked about very much called uh, What Are You Doing in the Revolution? You know, what have you mm -hmm. done? In the, what, uh, uh, which is all about someone who impersonates Zapata uh, in order to protect a, a, a sort of ham actor played by Vittorio Gassman, who mm -hmm. has to impersonate Zapata. And in, in the tradition of those films, he starts off being very cynical about it. And of course, as the film progresses, he comes to believe in the things that Zapata believes in, and he ends up as a revolutionary, like, like so many That's of true. the characters in those films. They start off as cynical and mercenary, and they end up converted to the cause and it, yep. it, it's a clever film and I like it and I'm not sure there's a very good print available I don't know Tom you probably know but uh, whether there's a good DVD dubbed into English I, I'm not no, sure I've seen that. it one time and it wasn't very good <clears throat> no no exactly but I'd, I'd like that one so Salima um, of the I mean Django obviously you know and I, I, I enjoy um, what else gosh uh, 
there's so many. I mean, you know, there's 400 other things to choose from. It's uh, yeah, like 800. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Let, let me, I, I even yeah. enjoy the Karl May films a little bit. You mentioned Karl May at the beginning. You know, some of those German films, it's the, um, uh, well, I, I thought of this the other day, actually. I was watching The Sisters Brothers, the movie that was made a couple of years ago. Didn't do very well, but I enjoyed it very much. And I found the landscape very odd, uh, uh, but it was, you know, wonderful canyons, rocks, forests and all this, but they didn't look quite right. And then in the credits, it said that it was shot in Romania. Uh, and I thought, oh, that's interesting that, that, you know, the Wild West has moved to Romania. Well, I felt that about the Karl May films, that they were shot at Split on the Adriatic coast and the wonderful forests and lakes and uh, mountains of that part of uh, Eastern Europe uh, look absolutely wonderful in the Karl May films. It's the oddity of the visuals that so often intrigues me, the costumes and the settings and the locations. And uh, uh, so I think the Karl May films maybe are ripe for a, a reappraisal a bit. So some of them are really very good, I think. I was going to ask you about Spaghetti Westerns before that. You, I think I read about in 1961, you said there was, I think, a few of them such, I'll, I'll cite them here, uh, the Spanish Western, such as Tehran City, Savage Guns, and The Coyote. Is it yeah. because they contain <clears throat> foreshadowing elements of what was to come later yes. on, like like violence and corruption and revenge and uh, <laughs> a loader fighting against all odds? In your in your view, what constituted an early spaghetti western? Well, there are some elements that, that definitely relate to the later films. That usually there's a very sort of taciturn. Uh, uh, strong silent type as the hero and very flamboyant Spanish actors playing Mexicans, sort of wheezy baddies, you know, you, you, you get that. Uh, in the case of Savage Guns, as I mentioned, you actually have the locations in El Maria that were subsequently used by Leone and many others. Um, and the other connection is that a lot of those early films were produced by a man called Alberto Grimaldi. And Alberto Grimaldi was a lawyer <laughs> Uh, from Naples, who <coughs> got into the film business producing minor Spanish westerns in the early 1960s. And uh, I mean, Leone always claimed that um, he discovered uh, Grimaldi, and Grimaldi was nothing before he, he produced uh, um, uh, for a few dollars more. But actually, he had produced several films. And I, I interviewed Alberto. He died actually very recently, a few months ago. But uh, I interviewed Alberto about two years ago, and I said, you know, in a way, you were the father of the Italian Western because you produced those early films, you got them distributed in Italy, and you eventually ended up producing for a few dollars more and The Good, the Bad, and the Ugly through your company, PEA, uh, uh, Production European Associates. And so, you know, you're the link between those early films struggling to find an idiom that was genuinely European rather than a copy American, a link between those films and the films we all know and love made by Leone. And that there was one link between them, and that was Alberto Grimaldi, because he went on to make all sorts of films with Bertolucci, Pasolini, and, uh, you know, Last Tango in Paris, and Visconti, Fellini, all sorts of people. But his start in the business was with these small westerns and with the, with the westerns of Leone. And uh, Grimaldi said uh, his first tussle with the Italian censors, he, he had a lot of tussles with the Italian censors about particularly Last Tango and some of the Pasolini films. But he, um, uh, his, his first tussle with the Italian censor was the scene in The Good, The Bad and The Ugly where Sergeant Wallace build, uh, beats up Tuco, Eli Wallach, while the concentration camp orchestra plays outside. And that was thought to be too brutal for universal exhibition in Italy, so they gave it the equivalent of an 18 certificate when it first came out. And Grimaldi appealed and they said, well, you're going to have to shave that sequence and remove some of the brutality in order to get general distribution. And they came to an agreement. So when the film was uh, on general release in Italy, uh, they, they managed to get it a universal certificate. But he said that was the first of many tussles with the Italian censor. Uh, later on, they'd become much, much more serious where films were actually banned in parts of Italy. But uh, I thought that was interesting. He said the other thing was that um, it was the, the first sign that Leone would ignore his contracts where the length of the film was current. He had a contract with Grimaldi to produce a film of, I forget what the length was, should we say two hours? And he overshot it by a mile. 
and said, don't worry, Alberto, it's fine. And, you know, that was the shape of things to come. He did the same thing with Fistful of Dynamite, and that's why so many scenes were cut. He did the same thing with Once Upon a Time in America, and that's why 20, uh, well, the whole chunks of it were cut. And there's so many different versions of these films, that, and, and the same with Once Upon a Time in the West. That, but the first time he did that, said Grimaldi, was was with The Good, Bad, The Ugly, where although he was contracted to produce a film of a certain length, he just thought, I'll get away with it. I'm enjoying myself so much, let's make it a long movie. And that was the shape of things to come. And it backfired for poor old Sergio, I think, because you know what they did to Once Upon a Time in America broke his heart, literally. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, you know, and he died shortly afterwards. Uh, right. It was, you know, it was recut by one of the people who cut one of the Police Academy movies, and they just removed whole chunks of it and made it chronological instead of lots of flashbacks. Well, right. that's definitely one of one of the travesties of uh, of all time. I wouldn't want anyone from the Police Academy movies cutting one of my films. Really, right? Tom has an opinion, uh, Christopher. I don't know, Tom. Why don't you share with what how you think the spaghetti western should have went? Uh, was it Spanish or the Mexicans should have kept it going? The Mexicans. Why don't you explain that? Mm. Uh, I always thought that once the uh, spaghetti western started to nose dive and go away, even though we had some great spaghetti westerns in 77, 78, yeah. uh, that they would have gone to Mexico. I mm. mean, Mexico had the same look. I mean, that's what they the Spanish tried to copy. That's where the architecture came from. They same the same yeah. buildings. The yeah, same yeah. huts. They had American producers, directors, stars, only only hundreds of miles away instead of half a world away. Um, mm -hmm. They had already had a production. Uh, you know, they already had produced thousands of films, so they knew how to make movies. But yeah. uh, they made a couple of copies of spaghetti westerns. But I would have hoped, I guess, that that's where the spaghetti westerns would have gone for another mm -hmm. four or five years. That's interesting. That's a very interesting thought. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, yeah. I mean, it was right there in their backyard and they didn't take advantage of it. And it would have yeah. helped their uh, industry quite a bit by using yeah. all the American actors and directors and writers. Right. Yeah. I, but I also think, you know, if there'd been more infrastructure put in, in uh, Almeria, Alicante in southern Spain, you know, the people I spoke to in Alicante, and, and I don't know if this is true or not, but they said that, you know, that part of Spain was the part that held out for the longest in the Spanish Civil War on That's the Republican right. yep. against Francisco Franco, and that he punished them yep. by not giving them resources. And that had, the, had they been given resources, uh, a proper studio, proper uh, film laboratories, processing laboratories, and so on, that that would have been sustainable and that the great boom, the production boom of the mid-1960s in Almeria would have turned into a major industrial, uh, you know, complex. Uh, but unfortunately, they were starved of resources, and all they had was the location and lots of stuntmen. Yeah, and, no, uh, I agree. Uh, it's very, very sad. And of course, you go there now, and, uh, uh, you know, there's just huge polythene sheets over all the the great canyons yeah. where, where the films are made because they, they, they want to get more olive harvest during the course yeah. of the year. <laughs> no, it's true. But it was obviously, I mean, you know, um, Tabernas, which is the, the little town uh, nearest to the two big Leone sets, um, was obviously, uh, you know, there were several cinemas there in the 1960s for watching the dailies. And I went there a couple of years ago and I was just uh, showing some friends around. And, uh, you know, you walk down Magnificent Seven Street <laughs> and all these other streets. The whole place is sort of, feels like a 60s movie it's really strange but sadly it wasn't to last right i was gonna change uh the topic for a second um to or back to leone <coughs> once again wasn't he uh planning on making a civil war western at the time of his death uh starring richard gear and mickey rourke sounds like another heaven's gate maybe <laughs> yeah yes it was uh, two rogues uh going through the based um, I, I've read the treatment, actually, uh, which he wrote with um, uh, Luca Morsella, uh, the son of his brother-in-law, Fulvio Morsella, who was one of his producers. Uh, yeah, it's two rogues, um, uh, con men, uh, getting stuck in the middle of the Civil War. Uh, and it was based partly on uh, the work of Ambrose Bierce, you know, the short stories of Ambrose Bierce, partly on Mark Twain, roughing it. Uh, and uh, and partly on movies about the Civil War. It has a slight feeling of The Good, The Bad and The Ugly. It's 
it's two rogues who feel the war has got nothing to do with them and they just want to make as much money as they can out of the war and he wanted uh, yes um, uh, uh, Richard Gere and Mickey Rook who at the time were were the you know the stars of the moment he also wrote um, which I keep hearing is being actually made a TV series called Colt uh, which uh, the idea was to have a, a Western TV series where each week a series of hour-long episodes would plot the history of this weapon. So episode one in the Colt factory uh, in uh, uh, Connecticut, wherever it was, uh, and then uh, by the end of it, it's a rusty old gun in the Wild West and a grizzled old-timer is, is, is using this gun that doesn't really work anymore. And you just see all the stages in between. So you tell the story of the Wild West through this one gun from mass production through to the end of the line. And he wanted Clint Eastwood to play the elderly gunfighter in the final episode, if it was possible. Oh. And uh, this is what he said. But I keep hearing that they're, they're going to make it. And I heard that Robert Altman was going to make it. And then I heard that they were going to make it for Italian television. There was a rumor. I don't know. But uh, that was the other idea that he had uh, towards the end. It's a good idea, I think. It's quite clever. Uh, uh, and it uh, could make a great series if you had a great, great guest star in each episode, you know. They're, they're making a Django TV series in Italy. Oh, yes. It's already started yes. filming, so, you know, there's there's still hope. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Right. Uh, Tom, I was going to ask uh, Christopher, because well, we've had this discussion over, uh, well, you can't smoke cigars anymore, but we used to. Uh, how is important is it, uh, Christopher, that this of the spaghetti western genre is today as compared to what it was back in the 60s and 70s. I know you touched upon it earlier when you said, you know, there was a, there was a Vietnam War and there was like a counter-revolution going on. So the theme was always in that. But upon today's eyes, I don't know if it doesn't matter what age you are, you can be 30, 40, 50, but when you put in the Blu-ray or the DVD and you watch a Leone movie, you watch The Great Silence or Day of Anger, what do you think the difference is in the mindset of people watching it then than it is today? Gosh. Well, I think, um, God, that's, that's an interesting question. I mean, it, it, um, I think you can see, you can see in those films, uh, the birth of the, the modern action hero. I mean, some people say that, uh, you know, the birth of the modern action hero is James Bond in Dr. No, which preceded for sort of dollars. But James Bond was a secret agent working for Queen and Country. He was employed by the British government as a, as a spy. Whereas the man with no name or Joe, is not working for anybody. He's just working for anybody who'll pay him. And uh, he's cynical. He's he's not a crusader. He's very very stylish. He's very very professional. He's very good with a gun, and he's very very cool in the way he strides through these movies. And that is, you know, uh, Stallone starts there. Bruce Willis starts there. Schwarzenegger starts there. Uh, the modern action hero start. It, it all begins, I think, with that persona of the man with no name in the first of all. So I think people see that. Um, the music, well, uh, you know, so many movies today are jukebox movies, which are people, uh, you know, have their favorite rock songs and they construct the movie around the rock, rock songs, whether it's Tarantino or Baby Driver by Edgar Wright or all these other particularly action films, which are built around favorite uh, themes of uh, re recordings. Well, that starts with Morricone writing the music in advance of Once Upon a Time in the West. That was the first time that it happened, where the movie is actually shot round a score that's written in advance. So all those jukebox musicals that are so fashionable today actually begin in 1968 with Once Upon a Time in the West. And you can track, and the style, the, 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 the costumes, the, the, the emphasis on style rather than on moral belief or standing for things, you know, that a man's got to do what a man's got to do, or uh, there are some things a man can't ride around, all those things are the traditional Western. Instead, you have um, basically the hero is the hero because he's the most stylish and because he's the best at it. And, uh, and, and he looks the best. Uh, he's a kind of style statement. You, you don't identify with him because of what he believes, you identify with him because of what he looks like and how he carries himself. That starts with the Italian Western. So I think there's all sorts of points of identification with modern cinema, uh, and um, which is why, uh, you know, uh, as Quentin Tarantino said, you show the good, the bad, and the ugly in a film school, and everyone immediately recognizes it as the birth of today's cinema. 
today's action cinema. I'm not claiming that all movies are like that, but, but action films, Marvel films, the Marvel universe, all those things owe an awful lot to Italian Westerns, I think. Uh, emphasis on production design on, in a way, you're telling a very similar story. I, I mean, I agree with Chris. I mean, uh, shortly after Fistful of Dollars or the spaghetti Western genre into the 70s, um, you never saw an American cowboy without a three-day growth of beard. I mean, <laughs> immediately they all wanted to look like Clint, where in yeah, the past they were like Audie Murphy, you know, or like yeah. you said, J James Stewart, they were all clean shaven. Uh, the first yeah. thing you saw in the morning in a scene was a guy standing over a pan of water with a razor looking at a mirror tacked to a tree. Uh, it was yeah. all clean shaven, clean looks, uh, yeah. clean towns. So, yeah, that's all uh, influenced the uh, films of today, even – even without being a cowboy, a Schwarzenegger figure has got a growth of beard uh, when yeah, you and, see him. And, and, yep. and look, at the, look at the long coats in The Matrix. Yes, the dusters, yes. Yeah, they come from Once More Time. And they wear, you know, long coats. It became obligatory to wear a long duster in whatever movie you were in, whether it was gangster, police, or, or Western, you know. And uh, right. that comes from Carlo Simi's costumes in, in, uh, and I, I, in Italy. A lot more flat-brimmed flat 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 hats. Yes, yes. Uh, you know, and, and there's a cartoon-like quality to it, you know, that uh, a character comes in and he's wearing this larger-than-life costume, and you, you learn an awful lot about the character's, uh, his character, his personality, from what he's wearing, and there's a cartoon-like quality to that, you know, where, mm -hmm. you, you, you know, he's, he's sort of, um, he's so much like himself. It, well, it, it's, it's like the characters in um, uh, The Hateful Eight, you know, where... Yep. Where, where Tarantino was trying for that, where the yep. moment they appear in those costumes, you know a hell of a lot about them, and they were all <laughs> derived from Carlo Simi. Right. In fact, Santana movies, all sorts of movies came into, uh, came into uh, Tarantino's film. Moving on to another subject of Blu-rays and DVDs, which I guess have replaced the, um, the 16 millimeter film or the VHS film, yeah. and it'd be nice if uh, I could show up. There we are. And... Uh, <laughs> What do you think the advent is? Now you get crystal clear, almost 4K quality, so these spaghetti westerns can be enjoyed to its fullest by older fans like us and by new generations. Are, are you appreciative of the, of the new, uh, I guess, Blu-ray yeah. disc format? Yes. I mean, one slight problem is that uh, the, uh, uh, in these films, they wore an awful lot of makeup uh, and, uh, you know, to give themselves sort of a dark tan of the border country where they, where they were living and uh, and they you know they 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 um, they're wearing more makeup than we're used to in hollywood movies and sometimes that shows up on blu-rays and 4k's that uh, you can see the wig line and the makeup and so on so uh, uh, in some ways they're more detailed than they should be but uh, no it's great i mean you know turn up the Morricone soundtrack to full volume and just wallow in the 4k version of the good the bad and the ugly it's uh, can you imagine a better way to spend an evening no, I, I, I actually can't. Uh, <laughs> let me ask you, regarding that, you're also very well known for doing audio commentary for many of uh, Leone's Spaghetti Westerns. Is the process, does the studio or Blu-ray distributor contact you before they produce the DVD, or are you called upon afterwards to, to lay down your commentaries? Uh, it's after they've chosen the print. Uh, and they play the print that will be uh, used on the DVD, and uh, I speak to that. So, for example, in, in uh, Fistful of Dynamite, uh, uh, Ducky Sucker, uh, my, my, my commentary is to the, the print before they put in the extra sequences, or some of the extra sequences, so it's slightly out of sync. But, yeah, no, it's, um, uh, that's a slightly endangered species at the moment, uh, from my experience, that uh, there was a golden age of those commentaries and extras for the DVDs in the 1990s and, and the teens. Um, and now with streaming and, uh, you know, documentaries that go with streaming and things, they, 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 there, there aren't very large budgets for those extras anymore. And you get certain labels which do wonderful, like Criterion, you know, does wonderful extras for these movies. And you get the whole double disc sets. with Janus Films. Sorry? Janus Films. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And right. uh, there's some, but some of some of the bigger studios, uh, uh, you know, they they can uh, they can sell just as so many DVDs without uh, without uh, the commentaries. So, um, uh, but the one I want to do is Once Upon a Time in America because uh, I did the other four um, 
I did uh, uh, Fistful of Dollars, Few Dollars More, Good, the Bad, and the Ugly. I did the Good, the Bad, and the Ugly in the United States, but it hasn't actually come out in England, that commentary. And Ducky I did, Sucker. I did Ducky Sucker. I did part of Once Upon a Time in the West, but I really wanted to do Once Upon a Time in America. I think Richard Schickel did it, and uh, um, who was an acquaintance of mine, and he... Um, uh, he used my book a lot, but I'd much sooner do it myself, actually. But anyway, yeah, there so we are. would we. <laughs> <laughs> Tom, do you have a last question uh, for Sir Sir Christopher? I want to know what he's got in the works. Do you have a fifth right. book planned? <laughs> well, no, fifth and sixth, maybe. The the um, no the the publishers interested in exploring a possible companion volume to the Once Upon a Time in the West book about Once Upon a Time in America, possible. Uh, I've, I've got the interviews with, with, with everyone and I've got access to the photographs, but I'm not convinced that Once Upon a Time in America has quite the cult following that Once Upon a Time in the West had, indeed that the Westerns had, and I'm not sure that it would do as well. Anyway, that's a question mark. But if I don't do that, what I would prefer to do is a book of um, all Leone's writings about cinema and a lot of his interviews about cinema, many of which had never been published outside Italy and Spain and France and Germany, and call it Sergio Leone by himself and have pictures from the Bologna archive of all his films as he talks about them. Mm. I think that would make a very, very nice book. And yeah, that's, that's, the one I, that's the next one I think I, I'd, I may be doing. It depends. I mean, if they find out that once upon a time in America, there's this huge demand out there for mm -hmm. uh, a book. Uh, on the same basis as Once Upon a Time in the West, then they might go ahead. But I have my doubts. I just don't love that film in the way that I love the Westerns. There's some, I admire it. I think it's a great piece of filmmaking, but my heart isn't quite in it in the you way know, that it is. I, I, think it, I kind of think it looks like a Godfather film, quite personally. Yeah. Um, yeah. When I saw it, I, yeah, it was his version of the Godfather, at least in my, my eyes. Um, the cat. I don't know. I that's. I know we're getting off topic, but we're just going to talk one second about it. I enjoy Once Upon a Time in America. I actually like the part more, mostly with James Woods and De Niro as adults. That first hour, hour and a half when they're kids, I just, I just deal with. Is that kind of how you feel? <laughs> I quite like the kids bits. Actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm okay. I, we wanted to thank you so much for. Um, for joining Tom and I on this special show. We've been waiting, I think, over a year to get you. You waited for the right amount. We kept raising the price. <laughs> and uh, you finally accepted. But no, it's been a thrill and a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to talk to you and ask you the questions that we wanted to ask you about Spaghetti, spaghetti Western. So I hope you had at least a little fun. I did. I had a lovely time. And uh, I, just, um, I just wanted to say, finally, that... Uh, when first I interviewed Sir Giuliani in London, uh, the first time I met him, he said something so nice to me that it's really stuck in my mind. He said, it took an Englishman to take my film seriously. Wow. And uh, I think I'd like that written on my gravestone. And I saw Christopher Frailing's first book and found out his background. I said, this legitimizes my, my love for these films because most people, as you know, they were... Uh, Spaghetti Western. So yeah. I appreciate you coming on, Chris. Yes. Oh, well, thank you. Tom. It's always always a pleasure. Always a pleasure. Well, are you for, yeah, any more book tours in the states? Uh, yeah, I may be coming over in the spring. Uh, I've done another book, <laughs> uh, a non Leone book, which I wasn't mm -hmm. talking about, but it's called The Hollywood History of Art, okay. and it's all about Hollywood movies about real life artists. And there's the chance that it's going to be launched in. New York in March, April, in which case I'll be over, in which case I'd love to come to the West Coast. Tom said that when you come out to the West Coast, you're free to stay at his villa. Oh, boy. Exciting. <laughs> I'll, I'll, take, I'll take you up on that, Tom. Okay, Chris. Anytime. Lovely. Tom, what do we always say to everybody? Adios, amigos.